Welcome back. Okay, so now we begin endocrine. Three chapters. It's going to be chapters 38, 39, and 40. This is chapter 38, which just is an overview of the endocrine system, what its functions are, what uh, organs are included, assessment, etc. So we're going to identify the glands in the endocrine system and explain their function. Talk about aging, because we always do, right, and what effect it has on the endocrine system. We are going to discuss the data that we have to collect when we're assessing patients that have an endocrine disorder. And we're going to talk about nursing care for patients that are undergoing testing for different endocrine disorders. Um, fun fact, when I was in school, nursing school, this was not my favorite subject. But turns out, it's one of my favorites now. Um, everything affects everything with the endocrine system. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. So the next slide, you have a diagram, and it talks about the anatomy and physiology, so what things are included in the endocrine system. So in the brain, you have the pituitary gland. Think of the pituitary gland as the king, because nothing happens in the endocrine system with the pituitary not being involved. The pituitary is in control. But if the pituitary is the king, the hypothalamus is the queen. And you know, happy wife, happy life, right? The king can't really do anything unless the wife says it's okay, the queen. So those two glands work together to help control all the rest of the glands that are involved, okay? We have the thyroid gland, which is the only endocrine gland that can be palpated. You'd have the patient hyperextend their neck. And then right about here, when they swallow, you should be able to feel the endocrine gland. And there she is, okay? You have the thymus gland, which is right in the middle of the chest, the mediastinum. The thymus gland in children is really big. As we grow to be adults, the thymus gland shrinks. Why, you ask? Good question. Because the thymus gland is where T cells, those particular types of white blood cells, are trained. T, thymus. T cells are trained in the thymus. That's the way to remember it. So when you're a kid, those T cells mature in the thymus gland, and that's where they're learning what belongs to you. So don't attack us. But if something strange gets in, like a pathogen, then attack that. Kill it. Okay? It's your thymus gland. Um, I forgot that next to the thyroid, you have two itty-bitty glands called the parathyroid glands. They control calcitonin. Calcitonin controls how much calcium's in your blood and how much calcium's in your bone. Keeps that balanced. Okay. And then on top of each of your kidneys, you have an adrenal gland. And the adrenal glands work with the kidneys for maintenance of blood pressure and fluid balance and those kinds of things. And then we have the male and female reproductive glands. And so for women, we're talking about the ovaries. And for men, we're talking about the testes. In this chapter, we're not going to get into that. Okay, that's next term for you guys. But we are going to talk about disorders of the thyroid. We're going to talk about disorders of the adrenal glands. And we're going to talk about disorders of one of the biggest issues, which is the pancreas. And the pancreas is an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. But anyway, we're going to get to that in a second. Okay, we're not going to get into it very deep when we review anatomy of the pituitary and the hypothalamus. So I'm not going to worry about that. Um, but here's where I really want to focus on um, the thyroid. Thyroid controls your metabolism. So how fast, how slow is your me basic metabolic rate? So if you're just sitting, not doing anything, you know, there's a certain amount of energy that you need just to exist, just to be, right? And so the thyroid gland is in control of that. That's important to understand, okay? Um, a lot can go wrong with the thyroid, and we're going to get to the following chapter where we talk about hypo and hyperthyroidism, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, talked already about the parathyroid glands. The pancreas. Oh, the pancreas. Pancreas, very important organ. It is endocrine. B12 
because for, from an endocrine perspective, it makes insulin, right? And I know you've all heard of insulin. It also makes glucagon. It's got alpha cells, beta cells. It also has delta cells, but don't worry about that. So we're going to be focused in on diabetes mellitus type 1 and 2 and the inability or insufficiency of the pancreas to make insulin, okay? Let's get to that. What are the effects of aging? On the endocrine system. So if you look at the chart on page slide 10, okay, um, it, it talks about the different things that can happen. So we're not going to talk about growth hormone. That's no one's going to ask you about that. But TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from the pituitary, stimulates the thyroid to make thyroxine, T3 and T4, right? Well, there's a decreased production of thyroid stimulating hormone. So as people get older, especially women, you will see hypothyroidism because of that decrease in TSH. And, you know, sometimes a decrease in the amount of insulin that's produced. Um, there are a lot of other factors, though, that are involved in diabetes. So I don't want to kind of fixate on that. But let's just talk about the nursing assessment. Okay. Remember, you think potassium, you think muscle. You think calcium and magnesium, you think nerves. Well, here you go. When you are getting a health history from a patient, do they have any neuromuscular issues, right? Their reflex is sluggish or hyperexcitable. Well, calcium is what controls them. And then calcium can be a problem if there's a problem with the parathyroid glands, right? Have they had weight changes where they've gained a lot of weight, they feel like they're not eating, or they've lost a lot of weight? and they're eating constantly, thirsty all the time, urinating all the time, intolerance to hot or cold temperatures, labile mood. Make sure you know the word labile. Labile means it's up, it's down, not stable, okay? Labile mood, I'm happy, and then I'm mad or I'm sad, okay? And then how's their memory? And then let's talk about family history because a lot of these disorders run in families. So those are all important things. You're going to be assessing, of course, their vital signs, their weight, their skin, any changes in the skin, oily, dry. Do you notice any tremors? You know, any shaking? What does their affect look like? Affect is the expression on your face. Your affect should match your mood. So if I'm talking about, wow, we went on a trip and I had so much fun, I'm going to be smiling, right? So my affect, my expression matches the happy tone, okay? So it's important to be, you know, alert and aware of somebody's affect because if they're just blunt, flat, yeah, we had a great time. It's a problem, right? Exophthalmus. Make sure you know that word. Exophthalmus. Exophthalmus is, I call it, the googly eyes. So did you ever see Wendy Williams? And she's got those eyes that are like, Boing, boing, boing. They're the googly eyes. They're not really googly eyes. Exophthalmus is a symptom of Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism, where there are fat pads inside the eyes that get like, overgrown and their eyes just look like they're bulging out of their head. Then fat pads at the base of the neck called a buffalo hump. And then there's something called a goiter which is an enlarged or overgrown thyroid. So if you see somebody walking around with a swelling, big old lump here, it's a problem, thyroid problem, hyperactive thyroid. What tests do you need to know? Okay, when we're assessing the thyroid, you need to know TSH, okay, thyroid stimulating hormone, and then you need to know T3 and T4. Pay close attention, okay? When you have a hyperactive thyroid, brrr, thyroid's in overdrive, your TSH is low, but your T3 and T4 are high. If you have a hypoactive thyroid, so your thyroid uh, slow, then your TSH is high. The TSH is always the opposite of what the thyroid activity is. Thyroid activity low, TSH high. Thyroid activity high, TSH low. Picture a seesaw. 
but the T3 and the T4 match. So thyroid activity high, T3 and T4 high. Thyroid activity low, T3 and T4 low. Okay. And then calcium, serum calcium level, 8 to 10, 8 to 10, 8 to 10, 8 to 10. Make sure you know that. Okay. Now, when we're talking about diabetes mellitus, pancreatic function, we're talking about blood sugar, fasting blood glucose, 60 to 100. Then there's something called the oral glucose tolerance test. For those of you that are, have had kids or that are pregnant, you may or may not have had that glucose tolerance test where you go in fasting and they give you this drink to drink that's sweet and syrupy kind of. Then they check your sugar an hour or two hours after you've had that drink. They're looking to see if your pancreas will make insulin to metabolize the sugar that you ingested when you drank that drink. And so 140 or less is a normal result for glucose tolerance test. If it's 141 to 200, they're questionable, but anything greater than 200, diabetes. And then hemoglobin A1C, which is also known as glycosylated hemoglobin. It's not sugar. The word glycosylated means sugar-coated. When you see the word glycosylated, think of the sugar-coated donut. They're looking at your hemoglobin, your red blood cells, to see how much sugar is actually stuck on your red blood cells. It is not a fasting test, okay? It gives us an idea of about a 90-day window of what that patient's blood sugars have been. And if the patient is a diabetic, the goal, we want that hemoglobin A1C to be less than 7%. If they are non-diabetic, 4 to 6% is normal, okay? So make sure you know that. We're going to talk a lot more about these things once we get to um, diabetes mellitus. And when it comes to the adrenal glands, the one thing that's really important is something that they may call ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Think about it like this. If a diuretic makes you pee, makes you get rid of fluid, an antidiuretic makes you hold on to fluid. And this is all going to be important when we move to the next chapter. All right, well, that was pretty short and sweet. That's probably one of the shortest videos ever. The labs that I've talked about, know those labs, okay? And we are going to proceed on. The next video is going to be chapters 39 and 40. And we're going to talk actually about the pathophysiology associated with these different disorders. So, ta-ta for now, guys, and we'll see you soon. All right.